Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped to develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-IV task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to a Talking Therapy, our fifth podcast. This is Marvin Goldfried and... I'm Alan Francis. Hi, folks. Hi. So, uh, so today we've decided we're going to continue our discussion on how to be a good therapist. And we touched on some of the issues last uh, podcast about, you know, when, when should we use our, when can we learn to use our heads rather than manuals for learning how to do therapy and for learning how to improve our clinical skills. So um, let's talk a little bit more ab about that. And uh, my own sense is that our method of training and updating the skills of practicing clinicians is very much 20th century. We're not taking into account the huge potential of our technology. Uh, and uh, want to kick around some ideas with that. How does that sound to you, Alan? It really, it really appeals to me a lot. I think that we couldn't have developed. We we're trying hard to invent the worst possible system of training. We, we couldn't do a much better job than create what we have now with different sectarian schools, each running their own training programs with very little integration of all the techniques of therapy. Having now, I think, something like 500 different techniques identified, everyone pushing my therapy is right, your therapy is wrong, people not learning the wide variety of techniques to, to train every individual, every therapist, because patients don't come in neat packages where one technique will work. People need to learn a variety of therapies, and we just don't teach them that. Absolutely. So the, I believe that the training needs to identify what the key aspects of therapeutic intervention are that cut across different schools of thought, identify what they are, and then come up with methods based on our current technology of having clinicians beginning and even, even more advanced clinicians learn to hone their skills making use of this technology. So that's perfect. I think to start with our discussion to figure out what we would want to teach and maybe it'll take another session to figure out the politics of it because it's turned that into such a guild, each school having a guild interest competing with other schools. How would we ever practically get from what should be the training program to correct the mess we have now with war yeah. schools? Right. So there is um, an area of research that is not very well known because I think it's been eclipsed by decades of clinical trials, namely process research. And um, I became interested in this uh, back in the uh, 80s, um, where I was interested in exactly the, the issue that you're talking about. What do different schools of thought have in common? Let's look at the process. Um, and in learning about this, uh, it became very, very interesting because there's some very key implications of process research for clinical practice. It's, it's the question that is being asked in process research is, what did the therapist do to bring about change in this session and in the long run? It's really interesting, Marvin. I recently read something that you wrote. And as I was reading it as a brief piece, I realized I could have written it. The, the words you were using were words that I would have loved to. You said better than I could, but they were perfect words. So why didn't you write it? Well, your, your training and mine couldn't be more different. 
your experiences and mine couldn't be more different. You come from a primarily CBT background. I come from a prim primarily psychodynamic background. But when you wrote this piece, I could have written that piece. And what this says is that there is a commonality. Exactly. It's being, it's being lost in the schools. It's being lost in the books that are written about each type of therapy as if it's in competition with other therapies. It's being lost in the manuals. And if you can figure out a way to bring back a kind of holistic therapy that encompasses right. the different techniques, you will be a genius. Despite our different backgrounds, there's a similarity we both have. We both teach, supervise, do research, and are, clinic and, and are clinicians. So we know the world of research, and we know the world of clinical practice. And that makes us somewhat, unfortunately, that makes us unique, because there are many people who are totally clinicians or total researchers. And these are different worlds. It's a totally different world to be a clinician versus a researcher. To be a clinician, what do you need? You need referrals. To be an academic, you need publications. To be a clinician, you need insurance contacts and reimbursement. To be an academic, you need grants. So that while people may start off similar in their training, the demands of their work differ, even though they may be dealing with the same issues and the same questions, how to best help people. So I think the fact that we see what goes on clinically, and we know that there's a clinical reality, kind of keeps us honest and not get caught up in a, an academic world too much. And also, neither of us had a strong guild competitive interest in pushing, promoting one form of therapy over the others. We've always, I think, both of us seen the values that different, various, very well, different uh, things bring. I don't know. I mean, I fought real hard to help back in the 60s to, to help behavior therapy get on the map. And then I fought real hard to get cognition into behavior therapy. Um, but it was only later on that I, re that I realized that, um, yes, there are some similarities. And, and we are all going in different pathways, parallel pathways that do not intersect and not benefiting from each other's uh, uh, knowledge and experience if we stay within our orientation. So I think eventually... Which are the most important integrating concepts that would help to, to unify training so it wasn't so atomistic? I think principles of change. And what do I mean by principles of change? Um, and we started talking about this in one of our earlier podcasts of the, uh, uh, the work of Jerome Frank and um, of the, of the uh, shamans and all of giving a person hope giving them a sense of positive expectation. Having motivation and positive expectation is not school related. There are issues that cut across different schools. So you can say a principle of change that cuts across different orientations is the facilitation of a positive expectation and a motivation to change. So you would make that essential? Essential. Every training program in the country should have that as an initial kind of bedrock. To Absolutely. Work yes. Wasn't it Freud who said that, the, that the, the patient may be skeptical, but they should have some hope and there should be a, ben a benevolent skepticism? So basically, or as I I've, I've tell my students, the goal of session one with a patient is session two. And I always said the exact same thing, again, independently. Right. And there are data to show that for beginning therapists, there are many, many cases that they experience where, where the patient doesn't come back for the second session. So you've got to be able to make that connection, that human connection. You've got to be able to make sure that the person is motivated and there are different skills that are involved in that. And there's research that is being done on this. So we know clinically that this is important. And there's research to show how do you facilitate motivation? What are those skills? I'm not real happy the way it's been described. But basically what it is, is it, 
helps to take somebody who's not motivated and get them motivated. It helps to increase motivation. So somebody could have some motivation, but they need to be motivated even more. And the work was originally done uh, with substance uh, abusers who had to be in therapy, but didn't want to be in therapy. And they didn't want to be told what to do. So the intervention was very much um, person-centered, client-centered of, gee, I, you know, I know you don't want to be here. And I, that's a tough situation to be here when you don't want to be here. So there's a bonding, there's a validation. And then gradually the therapist gets the person to recognize that there would be benefits to being in therapy and that there'd be negative consequences about maintaining the status quo. So basically what I think is getting the person to become motivated by looking at potential consequences of not doing something versus doing something, changing, growing versus not growing. Yeah, I, slightly different words. The way I would put it was you really have to get the patient's attention. There has to be something in the interaction with you that gets them thinking differently, feeling differently. Um, they should come away saying, gee, I, I learned something about myself that's useful. And I think normalizing, instilling a sense of hope, educating that you know stuff about what their problem is, showing empathy for their problem by the questions you ask, being able to anticipate some of their feelings before they've even been able to get them out to you. The, the more that you make this a really interesting session, the more likely you are to have the start of a beautiful friendship. Yeah. Therapeutic friendship. Right. And, and we've spoken about this of, of, of uh, really caring, genuinely caring, and having that caring come across. Um, Why isn't this? It's so obvious. Why is not this universal across every school of therapy? Why do they focus so much on the my sort of minuscule aspects of technique and not something that's so basic, so human, so right? Well, we, we touched a bit on, on this in, in some of our past podcasts. And certainly uh, the area of behavior therapy uh, is to be, I guess, to be blamed for some of this, uh, although it was not an intention. Essentially, the whole notion of behavior therapy was let's take how people learn based on research and apply it in the clinical setting. So most of the learning that was done back in the 50s was classical and operant conditioning. And there were specific research techniques that were used for conditioning and deconditioning. So the focus was on technique and less on the relationship. And the blame that comes from the psychoanalytic world was due to a misunderstanding of what Freud and Ferenczi were trying to how they were trying to shape psychotherapy. So Freud talked constantly in his sessions. The yeah. patients couldn't get him to be quiet. But somehow or other, the idea of the blank screen became popular, especially in America, and very strictly applied by some of the analytic institutes. Yeah. So no longer well, talk that way, but it was enough of a factor that it, it paralyzed a lot of really good therapists right. thinking that they had to provide a blank screen. There were many, many therapists over the course of the years who I thought were excellent until they began analytic training. And I'd send patients to them and the patient said, call back, say, can, can I see someone else? And I'd say, why? This person is terrific. She didn't say anything in the first session. Yeah. Well, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but somebody said that the reason so many analysts, particularly as analysis travels from uh, Europe to the U.S., with so many analysts are silent, was because Strachey was analyzed by Freud and wrote about his analysis and indicated that Freud was very silent. But somebody said the reason he was silent was that he wasn't comfortable with his English but he was very verbose with his German-speaking patients. Actually, it's somewhat apocryphal because almost all of his patients in the 20s and 30s, were, all those analyses were done in English. 
And the reason was that um, no one else could afford them. And so people would come to Vienna. And actually, his English wasn't bad. But I, I think it was, it was more that people were terrified of making a mistake. And they were more concerned about errors of, of commission than errors of omission. Yeah. And I think it's, a, it's absolutely unnecessary for, for psychodynamic therapists to be a blank screen. Yeah. It's a real misunderstanding of, of what was meant. But it, it's perverted the freedom. It's yeah. limited, restrained people in a way that prevented them from being normally human, normally curious, normally able to enter into an empathic relationship that would instill the kind of hope that you're describing. This is an interesting topic. And I would like to save that for another podcast, namely um, how people have misunderstood and misinterpreted uh, Freud. You got it. It's just fascinating. I have some very fascinating notions of, uh, about okay, Now let's get back to your teaching us what every therapist should be learning. Right. So they need to be learning how to get a person who is minimally motivated um, or has different expectations as to what therapy involves. There is research that's being done on this. And, the res and there's now the people who are doing the research are also doing clinical training. training. Here's what's involved. Uh, let me get back to process research. A notion in process research is that there is what's called the marker, M-A-R-K-E-R. And that is an event that occurs in session. Uh, it could be what a patient says or not says or something that's nonverbal that provides a signal that the therapist needs to do something. And this was a lot of the pioneering research was done by Les Greenberg, uh, who used an experiential Gestalt-like approach in his, in his work. So a patient might say, well, part of me thinks this and part of me thinks that. That would be a marker or a stimulus for the Gestalt-oriented therapist to do a two-chair technique and put the part of the person in one chair and the other part in the other chair. So Greenberg set up a model for doing process research, taking significant markers in a session, and then laying out what the therapist needed to do, and then would measure the outcome at the end of the session as to whether it made an impact. So this makes a lot of clinical sense. And there's, there's uh, evidence, empirical evidence to, to back it up. These instances where there are markers, where there are events, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of them that occur, that cut across different therapies. Yeah, and I have a different term for it. I call it nodal points. Nodal because points, okay. Nodal points, it, a bit like magic moments. Right. You can call it what you want. People call, call it critical incidents. There was a book the, written by that, the, by Corsini on that. The whole point is it does cut across all the different types of therapies. That right. It's not, not all moments in that first session or in any session. It's, it's ongoing. Very, it, they're, it, not, they're not born equal. It's certain moments. So, if, opportunity. Yeah, so if, if we can come up with a compendium, of these markers, these moments, these critical incidents, these whatever we want to label it, if we can come up with a compendium of what occurs frequently in clinical practice and what's important to address, this becomes the groundwork for clinical training. Here's a question for you, Marvin. Yeah. How much is this a science and how much is this is an art? It's a craft. Or craft, right? It's a craft. How teachable is it? Put another way, how teachable is it to be able to be intuitively alive to those specific nodal points where you can make a difference? How teachable? If you see it on the screen, on a video, and if there's a commentary, a voiceover by the trainer that says, notice the expression on the face. Notice the way the person has sat back. Notice the tone of voice. These are all indications that this person is withdrawing. Why are they withdrawing at this point? And then what do you do to deal with somebody who's withdrawing from the therapy? And 
work has been done on this. Research has been done on this. We, we have guidelines of here's what you do. And people are now starting to use this for clinical training, developing videos. Well, the thing I love about that is it, it starts with the patient rather than the technique. That it starts with, let's try to understand yep. as well as we can each individual, were the nodal points in that individual's reaction to us, and what's the right. best way of saying something that will get their attention and make a difference? It starts with the patient, but here's another thing too. It starts with the clinician. That is, this is something that clinicians need to know. And I just wonder, do you think that research on therapy might have the important function of helping clinicians do what they need to know? Well, this is one place that we already identified a difference, that you're more the scientist, I'm more the, uh, the craftsman. And, and, and uh... that's how, how could that be a difference? Uh, what I'm basically saying is here are clinicians let me, let me back off and, and come in from another point of view, okay? Let's suppose we use our technology to get a thousand clinicians of different orientations submit these markers, submit these critical points. And let's suppose we sort them into different categories. And let's suppose guidelines are set up and are tested to make an impact in the session. Is this not giving clinicians what they want? This, this is really, this is um, bridging the gap between research and practice. I, I, again, it's, there's a difference between us, but we shouldn't magnify it because we're more alike than we are different. But the difference would be that in, in my perspective, it's been more helping the person be a better instrument helping them be more aware of other people, more aware of themselves, more aware of what's important. Yeah, in the okay. Situation. Well, that, that's fine. Less a technical transfer of knowledge. Okay. So when you said it, let, let them become more aware. Let the clinician become more aware, okay? I immediately have had a vision. This is a chapter title. And what I'm saying is what's in the chapter. Yeah, exactly. And, and one of the things I admire about you is that it, it, I've never written much on psychotherapy. I've written tons of things about a lot of things. It's very hard for me, or has been hard or impossible for me to put into words what I would do when I was supervising and what I would do when I was in therapy, <laughs> because so much of it was intuitive and not cognitive. And I helped my trainees to be more intuitive, but I didn't give them the tools that, that you give them. I think one of the great advantages of your approach to mine is that you have the ability to put into words, abstractions, things that I more, I felt, but wasn't able to express as clearly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, all right, let, let me- uh, I'm complimenting you, enjoy I, it. No, I appreciate, I know I'm, I'm hesitating. I, I do appreciate this. And it's like heartfelt, Marvin. What's that? It's Heart a heartfelt compliment. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm saying you're better than me. <laughs> Enjoy it. OK, I'll take it. It's a corrective experience. People who are analysts also have hearts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but what I was going to say, and, and here I'm torn because it's like I like to follow an agenda. And so we may need to do we may need to continue the theme of training. Uh, at, at another time. I just, I had an insight, okay? In the past uh, podcast, you had an insight and, and you were saying something about me, the compliment. And I was thinking about that. Uh, and that's why I didn't thank you right away. Um, I learned this in graduate school. I learned, I had a schizophrenic education in the sense that I learned about learning, perception, research methodology, where there was evidence and rules. And then the clinical stuff that I learned was on projective techniques and these vague notions of therapy. And there was no data on the clinical stuff. Um, and I was taught that 
if you're making a statement, there should be some kind of research backing. And there was no research backing for, for this. So there was always this gap that I've had in, in trying to figure out what, what goes on in therapy. Um, because it was, there, were, there were not a lot of clear guidelines. Yeah, you analyze the transcripts, you do this, you do that kind of thing. Um, but how do you do it? Well, I think the other thing that's very valuable in, in the approach that you've taken throughout your career is that in seeing which techniques work, the uh, remarkable and wonderful finding is that they're not really that different across the different therapies. That if you start out with the patient, the nodal moment, the kinds of things that a clinician will say, that it turns out that people from varying schools see it and say it in almost the same way, even though they conceptualize it so differently. Yeah. And I think through your command of the literature, you've been able to see what's really a common language that, that unifies rather than divides the different therapies. Yeah. It explains why the senior people in each field, the founder in each field, when they have a session, very similar to another guy who's in his book sounds like he's exactly the opposite. So maybe we should talk about common language and one of our next uh, podcasts. Especially, I think we're going to be talking about training forever, because even if someone yeah. is as experienced as, you know, we're learning from each other constantly, you never stop training. The, yeah. the training programs last a few years, but your training lasts a lifetime. Okay, that's a very good point. So maybe we can start talking about substantive issues and then spill over into, well, how can a clinician learn this? You know, how can a beginning clinician learn it? But how can a more mature clinician uh, learn these kinds of things? But well, my feeling about this continuing education for therapy is that it's a total joke. That what do you mean? That you can get continuing education credit for attending oh. some lecture that, that probably makes minimal, if any, impact on your clinical practice. Yeah, the continuing education therapy is your next patient. So <laughs> each, each, each patient is a course, and each session should be a course. And um, the idea that, I mean, in, in my view, I think in yours is that every therapist needs to have in his toolkit or her toolkit the whole variety of techniques that have been found useful, mm -hmm. not to be focused too specialized on one technique. Okay. And I think that people tend to be more inflexible the less experience they have. Yeah. And part of continuing education is to broaden your experience, to see things and be able to do things in ways you never imagined you would be doing while you were in, in, in your training program. Right. And that'll bring us to a topic. We, we have about 30 or 40 topics in training. That'll bring us to the topic, why are the training schools so constrained? Why does training tend to narrow rather than broaden people's awareness? Well, these and other discussions, are we've got our future laid out for us, and, and it's always great talking to you, and it's always great learning from you. Me too. And I think maybe next time we can get more details about the techniques that bridge the different types of therapy. Or, or techniques or principles or you know, what, what are the basics that any clinician should learn? And then how can we go from those basics to the techniques? Because some of the techniques from different orientations are very, very important. Um, but I think you need, we need to know why we're applying the techniques rather than blindly doing this. And to give a hint to listeners, those especially who may think they know everything, um, I'm constantly learning from you the things that you say help put into the words the things that I do. But I do a lot of things intuitively without having a frame of reference that gives it a, um, an abstract and, and linguistic shape. And what you do is explain to me why I'm doing the things I'm doing. Sounds a lot like therapy, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm getting it for free. <laughs> Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Uh, Stay safe.